name is Kennedy Blakely, and I am the Communications Manager for the Ohio Mideastern Governments Association, OMEGA. Uh, for those who are not familiar with us, OMEGA is a Council of Governments local development district serving 10 counties and 12 cities across the Mideast region of the state. Um, with EDA CARES Act funding that we acquired, we were able to retain the Reed Consulting Group to conduct a broadband feasibility study um, as many of you know, broadband has long since been a challenge in rural Ohio, especially in Appalachia and in the Omega region. So using uh, data that Sean is going to explain in methodology, uh, the Reed Consulting Group was able to discern and pinpoint areas in each of our 10 counties that do have access to broadband and those that do not. Um, so we are hoping that with our study being complete this coming June, we will be able to help find additional solutions for rural areas and communities in terms of broadband. So we have Sean O'Malley with the Reed Consulting Group here with us today. And take it away, Sean. Untangled from the display. There we go. Thank you, Kennedy. Uh, glad you all could make it, and hello to everyone online as well. Um, I will be going over if you attended the. I did a presentation like this for the county a while back with a simpler version of our broadband profiles, sort of a preliminary report. So some of this will sound familiar because I, I don't know for certain everyone who is attending has ever seen this in any form before, so I want to make sure all the context is there. So bear with me if some of it looks familiar, especially when I'm talking about like the state level uh, information. This, is not, this would not be possible without Omega being able to help out with the funding here with their CARES Act money. Uh, also neighboring development districts, Buckeye Hills, OBRDC, and Eastgate also have helped with this project uh, with connecting Appalachia, as well as quite a few other funders across the state. Without these folks, this could not have happened. So I do like to give them a shout out at the beginning. This is really about positioning our region for the win. My apologies for the Bengals picture. I know we're closer to Cleveland and Pittsburgh over here than we are to Cincinnati, but uh, Joey Burrow is a hometown boy, went to high school with my kids. So uh, I think he's a good example of, uh, of, of someone from our region doing well. Um, first step to do, you need to identify where the problem is and then you need to prioritize among all those locations, where do you want to fund and what do you want to do? Um, the next one is to find the funding to do it. This is a good time for that. There is a lot of money out there, more so than the last time I spoke about this. Finally, you need to track where the money's going and enforce that it actually, that the work actually gets done. Um, as you'll see in a moment, some of the programs in the past from the federal government did not have good tracking or enforcement and the money sort of just vanished. So this is a pretty startling picture. I'm going to start at the state level, and then I'll zoom down into Holmes County. Uh, so looking at the state, all of that dark red and orange is what the FCC would consider unserved. Uh, essentially, if you're not in one of the major cities, you probably don't have a whole lot of territory that, is, ha that has broadband by that minimal definition. And a lot of that colored stuff on there, the yellow and kind of the pale green, under the new Infrastructure Act, that's considered underserved. Anything that's below 100 megabits uh, download and 20 megabits up is considered underserved, so it is eligible for funding as well. So only those little dark green patches, like if you look in Cincinnati, the, they're pretty easy to see there. Columbus has a handful, Cleveland's got a handful, Youngstown area has a few. Uh, when you zoom in on our individual counties, there's usually a few census blocks that have that level of service, but for the most part, um, as Tom was talking with Peter Vogerberg, the director of Broadband Ohio, the state agency responsible for managing broadband here, he's like, well, if you look at a state level, he's like, when you do the federal, the new federal standard, Peter's like, yeah, the whole state. Um, this is based on, among other things, nine plus million speed tests that were run by consumers, individual people who just Googled speed test, installed the app and ran it. Um, the state was wise enough to purchase that data, so we had a year and a half's worth of tracking of speed test results. That made a huge difference in verifying what actually has broadband and doesn't compared to what internet providers have told the FCC. We still need more speed tests. 
You can go to connectingappalachia.org. There are inst simple instructions there on how to do a speed test. The more data we get, the better. And it, I don't just want you to do it if your internet is bad. Do it if it's good, too. We want a real picture. So state level, the numbers you want to focus here on are the, those underserved rows. So if you go by square miles, it's two-thirds of the state. Uh, if you go by households, it's about 800,000 households that do not have basic broadband. If you go by the FCC's maps, they claim it's only 200,000. Um, they've since admitted that those maps are not good and that they understate the problem. If you go by Microsoft's internal mapping, they think there's 2 million households in Ohio that don't have broadband. This problem really comes down to population density. Uh, when you're in a city, there's plenty of houses per square mile to make it worth an internet provider's while to do the, ins the investment of installing fiber or, or coax. So like Columbus is 1,500 households per square mile. Even when you get down to a smaller city like McConnellsville, that's still almost 500 households per square mile. That's plenty for, for an internet provider to be able to make their money back on their own. They don't need any help. It's when you get out into what we call the rural expanse where population densities get below 2% of what it is in the cities, um, sometimes even below 10 households per square mile. At that level, you're not going to be able to get a for-profit provider to invest independently there because they just won't make their money back. Um, even if a municipality tried to do it with their own funds, they probably would not be able to sustain it just because of the costs. So that's where you need subsidy. The government is aware of this. It's not a new thing. It's been almost a century now. Um, I love this, this line from the Communications Act back in the Depression. All people in the United States shall have access to rapid, efficient, nationwide communication service with adequate facilities at reasonable charges. Now, they were talking about phones back then, but that wording can apply perfectly to broadband these days. And that same act is still in place. Since 1990, the FCC has given $100 billion to the t big telecommunications companies to fix this problem. We don't know really what has happened. A lot of that money just sort of vanished. There's been no effect. I like to compare this to road maintenance. If you quit maintaining your roads, you're going to get a lot of potholes after a few years. They're going to get pretty big. If you don't maintain them for decades, it's going to revert back to a Jeep track or a goat path. And that's essentially what we've got with our internet infrastructure in a lot of our region. Um, the cables that it runs on are copper. They were installed about a half century ago with some of that Telecommunications Act money. At the time, it was the ideal technology. It was the best technology around. It can support broadband, but you have to maintain it. Copper cables are good for about 30 years lifespan. It's been 50 now, and pretty much none of those have been touched since they were first put in. So at this point, they're worn out. The insulation's gone bad. There's water getting in. They don't work very well anymore. So to keep the road metaphor here, if you're going to put new stuff in, specifications are important. When you build a road, if you're getting funding, federal funding for it, there is a huge book that you have to follow of all the specifications for what that road has to have, like you know the, what the, the different layers that you're going to put down before you do the main, the main course and then the top layer. There are huge details on how you have to do that in order to be funded properly. That's not the case with broadband. Pretty much all they do is say, meet the speed. We don't care how you do it. Um, that can be good in the short term, but when you're talking about something that has to last for three or four decades, that could be a problem if they build something that's cheap, minimal, meets the speed right now that, that is the target. Well, five years from now, it's no longer any good. To give you some historical perspective on why this matters, the web was basically invented in 1990. And ever since then, we have seen tenfold increase in bandwidth need. So back when it first started, it was just around 100 kilobits per second. Uh, two, in 2000, it was up to a megabit per second. 2010, when Zoom started as a company, well-served area could expect 10 megabits per second. FCC's minimum right now for broadband is 25 megabits down, 3 megabits up. That speed was the speed that you could expect in a well-served area back in 2012. So that thing's already outdated. Today, well-served areas and cities are seeing 100 megabits per second. Who knows where it's going in the future? But I would expect that it's going to continue. Uh, it's very easy to imagine 1,000 megabits per second, a gigabit. There's a lot of companies, even cable providers, who offer that now. So a lot of people already have that at home today. Um, if you want to be able to meet those speeds, the old technologies, DSL, fixed wireless, and the, the old school satellite services, even the new one from 
Starlink, Elon Musk, they all top out at about 100 megabits. So they're fine right now. They would meet the, the new federal standards for considering broadband, but they're not going to be able to keep up down the road. Uh, cable companies, right now it's pretty common for cable modems to be able to offer up to a gigabit down. Uh, I started noticing, uh, I think Charter's offering two gigabits now. Uh, I think a number of local cable companies, I know some down in the southern part of the state are doing two gigabits as well. Uh, but they top out there as well, and they have trouble keeping up on the upload. Like cable companies, their infrastructure is all built around basically the cable TV model. Everybody's consuming content. They're not necessarily creating it and sending it back out from their house. But with working from home and telehealth and things like that, you need to be able to send out just as much video as you suck down. Fiber optic right now is the only technology that can make it all the way up to that 100 gigabit threshold. There actually are networks running at that speed right now on fiber. Are homes going to need that much in 30 years? Maybe, maybe not, but I, for sure they're going to, I see 10 gigabits is easily reachable, and fiber is the only technology that can hit that right now. So when you're planning, you want to look out three to four decades. You don't want to be just looking for tomorrow. Uh, this is a lot like a water system. You don't want to have to go back and dig up everybody's yards again in five years because you didn't put big enough pipes in. Uh, broadband's the same way. Shouldn't ignore the short term, though. Um, neighboring Conshocton County used some of their ARPA funding to fund a fixed wireless provider to get stuff in place now. Like, they, they already brought a tower online. They're going to put, like, 11 new towers up, and they're going to add antennas to another 10 or 12 existing towers. So they'll get a lot of coverage. They'll pick up a lot of households that don't have broadband right now. That's a good move. The technology may not keep up long term, but it makes sense because you're not going to be able to get fiber in right away. There's a lot of supply and demand issues right now, and with all this federal money coming down, a lot of providers are putting in orders already for new fiber optic cable and the electronics. So you're looking at a couple of years. Um, so in the meantime, it makes sense if you can find ways to fund other ways of getting broadband to folks as a short-term fix, by all means, look at it. So when you build a fiber network, not all fiber is the same. It does have, it, it's all the same technology, the little glass strands that use light to transmit data, and it's really fast. Um, but there are different sizes of cable and different levels of it. Um, when you put the cable in, one of the costs that you need to think about is getting, a, getting the utility poles ready to have the cable on them. Uh, in our region, usually you end up having to go on the poles because it's, you often hit bedrock pretty quickly when you try to dig. Uh, so underground is, can be kind of tough. The cost for making those utility poles ready ranges anywhere from 30000 to 60000 or higher. Some rural electric co-ops can do it even cheaper. Um, we've heard from a few co-ops that they've, they've been coming in between ten and 15000 But these are reasonable numbers. We are aware of a fiber project, again, in a neighboring district in OVRDC territory where the make-ready costs ended up at about 40000 on top of that, then you got to buy the fiber, pay the labor to put it in, get all the electronics. So when you add that stuff up, you're looking at about, conservative estimate, $81,000 per mile to get fiber out. Now you can do it cheaper. Uh, we're talking about building a network that will last for the next three to four decades and have plenty of capacity. Um, one of the things is you want enough strands inside the cables that there'll be a lot of room for future growth. Um, there's a basic cable called a drop cable that you can use that you can actually build an entire network like your backbone and everything along the roads and back to your, your central offices using nothing but drop cable, it's, but it's only got a handful of strands in it. It's designed usually for running from a utility pole to like a neighborhood or to a house so that there's a strand for each house. Right now in our rural expanse, you could get away with building a fiber to the home network using just that simple drop cable and it'd be a lot cheaper than the, than the number I'm quoting here. The problem comes that if people find out there's fiber to the home in that neighborhood, you're probably going to have folks wanting to move there. So you'll have more houses get built. You'll have kids of families who don't leave anymore because they can do a remote job and they'll stay. So that demand will go up, and then you run into capacity issues. You can't expand when you have that, that cheap cable. So we're recommending lots of strands in the cables, um, and there should be enough so that if cell providers want to start installing more cell towers, they can piggyback off of that fiber as well. Um, and just like 50% overhead for future growth as the population grows. Uh, we're also specifying that you should use good cable. Armored cable, squirrels love to choose, chew on fiber optic cable, even more so than power lines. 
I don't know, maybe it's because they don't die when they chew on fiber than they do when they chew on power lines. Um, but there's cable made that's designed to hold up to that. So even if they chew through the outside, there's a second layer in there that keeps water from coming in so that the squirrels don't end up taking everybody's internet out when they chew on the cable. And of course, we're assuming that you're putting this stuff on electric poles, like I mentioned, with the make ready costs. To go underground, we're estimating it's ten to fifty thousand dollars a mile more, um, and again, that varies. You might find some areas where you're lucky, and the bedrock is three feet underground in your entire territory, and you can just trench the stuff in real easily. Uh, in other places, you might hit bedrock after a half mile, and then have to go up onto a pole or use really expensive boring equipment to get through there. To give you a sense of why it costs so much to do this make ready. Um, some of it is clearance, and some of it is how old the poles are. So this typical electric pole setup, those top lines are the high voltage ones that distribute for the whole area on that pole network, and then the secondary lines below are lower voltages, and those are what they run the drop cables off to connect electricity to each individual house. Your communication space is down below there as well. Like you don't want a tech, a fiber tech up there or a copper tech up there trying to mess around near the power lines because either the power company has to turn the power off for everyone to work on it or you risk that technician getting killed because they don't know how to work around high voltage. So you're down in that space. When you add another line to there, you've got a minimum clearance you have to maintain. So there's our new line. Even if that meets the clearance, those lovely hills in our area often result in clearance not being enough because that stuff droops and it's passing through an area where you've got undulations under it. So not everywhere is going to meet the minimum clearance anymore. So then you have to put in new poles to move things up higher. Or even if the clearance is enough, fiber itself is pretty lightweight. It's lighter than like a power cable, uh, like a, you know, like that cable right there that's running to the wall. But when the I in the winter, when you get an ice storm, you can get a lot of weight on each cable that's on a pole. And if the pole is old, it might not be able to handle that extra weight, it would break. So then the utility company has to replace the pole even if it has enough clearance. So zooming down into our region, these are the Omega counties. As you can see, there's a lot of unserved territory here. Um, it's almost 80% of the populated acreage, and it's a third of the households. Um, so lots of unserved territory. Superimposing on top of this, this is middle mile fiber that belongs, the blue is existing. Um, it, it was put in by companies who are willing to rent or lease capacity on that fiber to anyone who's willing to pay for it, which is really useful for small internet providers who want to just provide service in this pr particular area. Um, that middle mile bridges the middle between the big pipelines that manage the handle the internet traffic nationally and the local space, what they call the last mile. Uh, Holmes County, was not able to benefit from this. This was a big project about 10 years ago that was supposed to bring middle mile to the whole region, but there were some cost to, costs ended up higher than they expected and they had to stop sooner. So the pink lines are what we recommend uh, folks focus on. There are programs still that are for middle mile only for funding. So if that's available, we recommend installing that middle mile there to make it easier to serve this region. Uh, Holmes and Coshocton both would benefit from getting additional middle mile there. Middle mile's not enough. You still have to have somebody who's willing to run the cables from that middle mile to the houses to do that last mile, but it helps a lot to have it already there. And there may be middle mile in the county already from like Charter or another provider like that, but those folks, when they build it themselves, they're using it only for themselves and they consider it a trade secret where the, the lines are, so they don't share that publicly, so we can't map that. To make it a little easier to see, this is a single color version, so those white spaces those are the ones that are already served. We just like make them grayed out so that it, they don't distract from it. And then we did a single color for everything below the FCC minimum. So federal funding, the FCC had a program in 2020 that they did an auction at the end of the year for subsidy to do fiber to the home. It's called the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, or R RDOF for short. Federal folks love their pronounced acronyms, so we call it RDOF. Um, Charter Communications won a pretty good amount of territory at Holmes County, especially on the western edge. Um, we expect that they will end up building there. Uh, we were originally a little nervous because the subsidies ended up being really low, just a tiny fraction of what it was would actually cost to do this. 
but they have already started building some of the territory that they want in Guernsey. They're already, they've already put in connections and they've got folks on fiber to the home now. And utility companies are reporting that Charter's been contacting them to arrange to find out how much it's going to cost to connect to their poles and get them ready. So that's a good sign. There's also, this is not going to help Holmes County now, but South Central Power, the rural electric co-op over there on the eastern part of the territory, um, won a huge grant from the state of Ohio to bring fiber to the home to their whole territory. So all of that dark purple in, in Harrison and Belmont and those little bits in, in Jefferson, and I think there might be a tiny bit in Carroll, those are all going to get fiber to the home within the next two years. Um, there are more rounds of this funding from the state coming, so it's possible that there could be a provider that would win that for the area in homes that hasn't been covered yet. This is what the, the awards looked like. Homes did not get any awards from the first round of the Ohio grant program. This isn't necessarily a problem. There's a lot more money that's coming down the pike uh, that's going to be distributed to this program. They only had, only I say, they only had $250 million for the state this first time around. Um, I'm expecting that they're going to see probably another billion dollars from the federal government. So there's plenty of opportunities for homes to get served in the following rounds. And, and actually, it might help that they didn't have any awards happen now so that when they open up the next one, they'll probably look at places that didn't get any awards yet. And once all of these providers have had their address list finalized, then we will map the rest of them. Uh, we were able to map South Central Power because we're working with them. Uh, but uh, these other providers, we, don't, we won't have anything until Broadband Ohio releases the final maps. At this point, I'm going to switch over to the Holmes County profile. So this document, you have a printed, I believe there were printed copies available for this if you want to follow along in there. It's also available online, uh, both through the Omega District's website and through connectingappalachia.org. Um, oh, hang on. I need to change how my screen share is operating here. And slideshow. Bingo. Gotta love technology. So as you can see, pretty stark, it's a pretty stark issue here. 73% of the households do not have access to 25.3 minimum speeds. And when you look at the colors, most of it's dark red, which is below 10.1, which is, these days, it's really slow. Um, you do have some well-served areas, but not that many. And a lot of those, again, will end up el eligible for funding under the new Infrastructure and Jobs Act money when that comes out, because they're still below 120. 88% um, of the populated area uh, doesn't have access. So to look at this a different way, the color coding here, that kind of salmon color, that again is the single, one single color for everything that is not served right now. So that's below 25.3. All of those census blocks do not have 25.3 service available in them. The white, we just blocked that out because that's where it's already served and we just didn't want to distract with it. The blue dots are business locations. Um, as you can see, a lot of the businesses are clustered in areas that are served, but you'll also see that there are quite a few spots, like up, up here in the northeastern corner, this whole southeastern quadrant, up here kind of central west. You've got a lot of places where there are businesses that are sitting in areas that do not have good broadband right now. The dots are sized differently to reflect how much demand we think that business will have. Uh, the way we did that, we got data from Dun and Bradstreet that identifies how many employees each business in the county has, what industry sector they are, and then we, we use that in a formula to calculate how much broadband demand it would be. So we, the more employees the business has, the higher the broadband demand, the bigger the dot. Um, for a business that has the same number of employees as another business, we may vary the dot based on the kind of industry they're in. Like if you're in healthcare, education, uh, banking, IT, things like that, you're probably going to be a bigger broadband consumer than like an excavation contractor. Even if you both have 50 employees, the health clinic, you're going to have all 50 employees running around with tablets all day, taking charts and, and doing patient records, and it's all cloud-based now. Whereas the construction company, yeah, they need broadband, but they probably only have like three, three employees in their office all day who are doing broadband stuff while the other 
47 of them are out running equipment on the job sites. So this is an easy way to be able to look at the unserved areas and decide, hmm, we might be able to cover a lot of businesses if we go in like, if we get a project like in this space or over on this corridor here. Looking at it on the residential side, this is not every single unserved household. It's just not possible to show 12,000 points on an image at this zoom. But we were able to combine them in a way that shows the population patterns. So you can see the in the well-served areas, you can see the clusters of the dots run together enough where it almost looks like a blob. But then out farther, you can see the patterns of like the roads or you can see villages. So again, you can use this probably in combination with the business layout to decide where perhaps you want to prioritize trying to get more funding to serve areas. And when you go to serve them, we do have one little line in the middle mile running through those well-served areas. But then again, all of this light orange is the space that's not served. And then we did an overlay of all of the roads in the county. And any road that passed through one of those unserved areas, we identified it and measured how long it was. So you've got 784 miles worth of roads that are in unserved territory right now. The reason why that matters is when you bring fiber to the home, you have to get it there somehow. And usually the best way to do that is to follow the roads because everybody's driveways are off of there. And there are sometimes a utility pole run that'll go off through the woods and then like up over a ridge or something. But most of the utility pole runs do follow the roads as well these days. So that's a pretty good way of estimating how much fiber you're gonna need and how much it'll cost. And again, the white, areas are served. Uh, if you get any, if you see any spots on here, yeah, there'll be some road sections like down there, south central, where you've got the served and unserved areas together. You'll see like little dashed parts for the roads. That's because we only took the segments that were passing through the unserved areas because they would be the only ones that are eligible for funding. Here's what it's going to cost. If you were going to do the entire county, all of the unserved territory, with fiber to the home, and remember this is that high quality network that we figured would be good for four decades. Just under 75 million total cost. Uh, you'd reach about 12,000 households. The density is about 15 and a half households per fiber mile, which is not bad. Some counties it's, it's down pushing being under 10. Uh, and the higher that density is, the more likely you can get an internet provider to invest. Based on that density, we figure an internet provider would be willing and able to sustain spending about $1,900 per household to serve it. So they'd be kicking in $23 million or so of that total cost. That still leaves over $50 million as a funding gap that's not available. That's where you need grant money to kick in to help with it. Comes out to about $4,200 per household uh, for that grant funding. Now once we have the state mapping better from this first round of the state grants, we will we're looking at combining that in our maps as well as that territory the Charter has said they're going to build with the RDOF money. So this number, that funding gap, is going to go down some because there are some unserved areas that will end up with Charter, especially in Holmes County, they'll take some of that off the table. So it may drop under 40 or 35 million or so once, that, once that's been taken into account. Again, this is the RDOF coverage. We've got two different colors of blue on here. The dark blue is Charter. We're, we're pretty convinced they're going to build. Um, we believe them when they f they're saying they're doing it, they're doing all the right things. We've heard they've been contacting utility companies to get on their poles. The lighter blue is a company called Mercury Wireless. And I think there's probably some tiny little pink dots in there for a company called LTV Broadband. So Mercury Wireless won a whole bunch of territory in the state, but it was all little dots. It was just like a census block here, three census blocks there. Looked like you shot a piece of paper with a shotgun. That's really hard to build a fiber network when you've got scattered territory like that. So none of their funding has been authorized by the FCC yet. Um, we're hearing that some of it might be in Ohio. We still don't know how they're going to pull it off. So we're not confident that they're going to build out. Uh, and the state of Ohio is letting people apply for grants on top of that Mercury Wireless coverage area. Charter in this first round defended all that territory. Like if you applied for some of their RDOF territory is another provider for Ohio money, then Charter had an opportunity to step in and say, hey, we're planning on serving that already. Don't give them funding. They did that. They defended it successfully. But as part of that, they signed an agreement with the state that they would serve that area within two years. So it's accelerated a lot because this RDOF money originally was a 10-year timeline. Tiny little pink dot in there. 
LTD broadband, we're not sure what's going to happen with them either. They recently got fined, I think, $100,000 because they broke the rules during the auction and they were colluding with another provider, like talking about their bidding strategies with each other so that they could win more territory. Maybe that means they'll do it. Maybe it means they're, they're a little sketchy and they won't. But in any case, it's a very small portion of the county, so it won't be too relevant. I'm not going to read all this to you about the methodology. If people, folks have questions afterwards about how we came to these numbers, I can, I'm glad to go over it with you. Uh, but we used more than just those speed tests I talked about. We also looked at existing federal data. Um, we looked at population density. Uh, we looked at, there are reports from the FCC where places actually got deployed in the past. We included those as well. Um, I do want to call out on the methodology here with the business, business opportunity index. This is this table over here on the right-hand side of the screen shows the industries and what we think their demand level is. So, you know, healthcare, education, TCOM, banking, those are the big consumers. Um, even like real estate, hospitality, publishing, that's still pretty high up on there. So when you get down into things like uh, Farming, hunting and fishing camps, energy extraction, mining, stuff like that. That's the low demand. Um, and that's not to say they don't need it. Um, dairy farms these days are very automated. They've got a lot of stuff that's digital, like their machinery needs the internet to talk back to a cloud server to manage their production and make sure the cows are happy. And if you don't have happy cows, you don't have good milk. Um, so they do need it. They just don't have need it on the same level that some of these other businesses do. We go into detail on all the assumptions we made about how this fiber network should be put together. Um, this, this report was put together before inflation kicked in. So we're recommending people add another like 10 to 15% onto costs when they're specking things out because until things settle down, things are gonna get more expensive. Uh, I've also got a simplified version of that graphic talking about demand. This is a really useful graphic when you're talking to funders. It's a good way of explaining why you want, how you can justify why you want to put in a high capacity fiber network when they look at just the population numbers right now and they say, well, you can get away with a, with a cable modem. And then we break down how the budget was calculated. We will, by the way, all of these maps, you know, like here on the page, or like on the screen, I have to keep flipping back and forth between them if I want to figure out how things overlap. We're working to put together a, a web version of this map that the Omega folks will have a login to and they can share it with the counties so that your planning folks can log into that map and it'll have all of these layers and you can, you'll have all kinds of control over which layers are visible at which time, how transparent they are. So you can essentially have one map of the county and then you can pull up two or three different of these analyses and lay them on top of each other and see through them so that then you can find your project areas. Because as far as next steps go, I think that is the most important one to do. Look at, look at all the areas that don't have any funding yet in Holmes County. Look at your population density, look at your business distribution, look at other priorities that you might have as a county, and then go to these maps, zoom in them on them close and figure out Draw, draw circles, draw little crazy shapes, and decide this is where we want to focus to try to get a grant in for more broadband or to bring broadband to that area because it doesn't have coverage yet. I, Tom and I have been beating our heads against the broadband program problem for years, more years than I care to admit. Uh, this is the first time we both have agreed that we are optimistic about where things are headed. Um, the feds actually are paying attention finally, and it's not just the FCC who have historically been less than useful with this. Um, there's a lot of money coming around. There's gonna be one to one and a half billion dollars brought into Ohio from the Infrastructure Act, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. That money's all gonna go to Broadband Ohio, which is that state agency I was talking about. They are awesome. I have very seldom run into a government agency at the state or federal level that has their act together as much as Peter Voderberg and Broadband Ohio do. They got that program up and running in a matter of weeks after the bill got signed to make that grant program. They have driven forward with fast deadlines on everything they've done. Like those awards have already been sent out. They are requiring people 
to do it address by address. It's not just saying like, here's a census block. If you serve one house in there, we're going to color that one green and say it's good. No, the providers are having to provide like ev all 15,000 addresses that they're going to serve for their, their grant request. And then after the challenge process is over, a few of those might get removed, but then they're going to go back later and say, okay, did you serve those addresses? You can't just give us like a little feel good report and say, oh yeah, we did it. Makes me really optimistic, and that especially that all that extra federal money is going to go through that program. There are going to be real visible results from that. There are a lot of options out there still. Uh, there's going to be another round of RDOF, or if not, I'm hearing some scuttlebutt that maybe the FCC is going to be required to cancel the later rounds of that, take the money that they still have for that, and then build a new program that works better. So that money is out there. It will happen at some point. Like I said, the Infrastructure Act, there's a bunch of money there. Appalachian Regional Commission has several grant programs that are good. Um, their power program, you can get up to two and a half million uh, for, th that's focused on like economic development, but broadband is one of the things that they see as being a factor for economic development. So that's an option. Um, they also, ARC also has distressed county funds that can be used for broadband. Uh, ARPA money that was given to the townships is another option that can be used to spend. Um, Coshocton County used a bunch of their ARPA money to subsidize a fixed wireless provider to install a bunch of new towers and add antennas to existing towers to get a bunch of coverage all across the county that people could connect to immediately. Uh, or like as they get the towers online, it'll happen like within a year. So that's something to look at. Uh, their Treasury Department is in the broadband business now. They've currently got like $270 million available that, that can be applied for. USDA has some money as well, a couple of hundred million. So this is a good time. In spite of what the maps look like and how, like how bleak the picture currently is, I really believe when you look at our region five years from now, it's going to look very different, both just broadband coverage and economically, because economic development follows broadband. At this point, I'm happy to take any questions. You wouldn't be able to apply for that one ARC program that focuses on distressed counties, though it won't hurt you in the Ohio, the Broadband Ohio grant program because their criteria for distressed is different and essentially all of Appalachian Ohio is, is yes, is considered, yeah. We, we can give you the, one of the classic politician answers, it depends. The other one being, it's too soon to tell. You talk about poor cell coverage and poor broadband in some areas. Um, can broadband brought in in the cellular network alone because of the broadband and some of the pieces of equipment that the phone and the antenna something that are connected into the broadband? Or Essentially, you need to connect fiber to the towers. Um, and so probably to get coverage, they would have to build more towers. Um, but in answer to that question, yes. If a provider installs broadband infrastructure, especially if they're a company that's willing to lease capacity on their backbone, then that can be a huge jump start for a cell company being willing to upgrade because they won't have to, the cell company won't have to eat the cost of running the fiber cables to serve their towers. They can just add, have the company run a drop cable up to their tower and then they lease the capacity on the on that company's fiber to be able to serve that tower. The towers that we see in our home county, are they connected by fiber? Uh, a fiber run somewhere? Yeah, somewhere there's a fiber run. Yeah. Maybe some of the older towers, if they're if they're slower speed, they might still be running on copper, but I I don't imagine uh, most of those, even the LTE connections, that can be pretty bandwidth intensive, so usually their feed will be fiber. Um, the problem is for those cell companies, is it's kind of that same game where they look at the population density and they say, well, it's not worth our while to both build towers and pay to run all this extra fiber to, to feed them. 
but if the fiber is already there, that, that cuts a big chunk of the cost out of there because ironically, as, as, as visibly impressive as a, as a tower, cell tower is, they're way cheaper to build than it is to run even a few, mi few miles of fiber. So yeah, it's kind of if you build the fiber, they will, they're, they're a lot more likely to come. Uh, 5G especially, 5G requires tons of fiber capacity if you do it right. Uh, I mean, you can turn 5G on on, a t on an individual tower and everyone will see 5G on their phone, but they won't necessarily get those crazy high speeds if they don't have a lot of microcells around the area, like a little mini towers that provide smaller coverage, because that's the whole thing with 5G is like its, its frequency and its capacity is designed to, to have much smaller cells so that you pass from cell to cell and you're not competing with as many fellow users to get the capacity. Uh, Nokia at one point published a paper about what the level of fiber that they would need to support it, and it's essentially a 100 gigabit backbone, like that top speed that I was showing in that graph. That's what you need to do. That's what you need running through your region if you want to have 5G towers every quarter mile. Competition is usually good. Um, if there was more backbone, like middle mile fiber, available as a result of one of these broadband expansions that was accessible, then that would make it probably a lot more likely for a competing provider to be willing to come in and put towers up and expand their coverage and, and then not be just a single provider anymore in the area. AT&T theoretically should be running some fiber for cell towers because they got a bunch of money. Like they won the contract from the FCC for the Rural 5G Fund, which is essentially a program that's meant to get towers in place so that first responders always have cell signal when they're in rural locations. Uh, they mentioned that recently at uh, a Buckeye Hills Development District meeting. They talked about that, but they didn't give any details on what they were doing. So. We'll see whether they spend that money well and actually start building stuff or if they're following the old model of uh, FCC funding. Verizon's the only game in town. Yeah. Verizon's the only game in town up here. Yeah, okay. but I'm expecting more feed on that than telephone or checking either. Yeah. yeah. Do you benefit from targeting just some of our small villages that have full coverage rather than the entire county? Uh, uh, it just seems like it's such a huge bite to yeah, yeah, when you look at the whole county, it can... Yeah, I think it's totally worth doing. Um, and again, you can be more successful because it's a smaller ask. Um, there's, there's one in Athens County that, that happened that way with, a, I think it was an ARC Distressed Counties grant, but they are doing fiber to the home in a little village called Amesville that has right now, they have basically no cell service and no internet. And it's it's not a it's not a city. It's it's probably a couple of hundred people, a couple of hundred households. And I don't know if you know this, but my mother lives in a small village and they they have very large manufacturing. Yeah. I think in this mountain here it's you know, two thousand people in the area. Yeah, I think there's definitely value to taking broadband to those small communities first because in each small community that you get that gets bigger fatter dollars. Yep. And if you get a bunch of little bright spots with small communities, then it makes it easier in a future situation to make the case, let's connect all these and let's pick up the rural households that are in between them. And a lot of, there is, I'm noticing with the business model with internet providers, they are starting to even focus on smaller communities that way on their own too. So um, yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's the right time to be trying to focus on small communities. And yeah, don't, don't feel like you have to always try to figure out a way to serve the entire county in one fell swoop. Uh, you can have a lot of success with these smaller grant programs, being able to just make a case for a village. So there was a conversation on on the transportation plan, transportation plan, and even the charity expansion. Ray County has been one of the biggest challenges here with charity, and that's a huge piece of our economic impact, not to mention revenue. Um, is it a is that too 
we talked about at the um, Friday session that might be out there using that topic uh, if, if that waypoint is there, because that's really where the one of the areas where we're struggling. And I know the team going forward is yeah. Um, and you know that's we have to still think of that in those areas, not just that particular technology. Right. I think talking would be a different situation there. So is there any conversation that's taking place for that wayfinding and safety? Or is that part of any discussion or funding sources that you're aware of? I'm going to look over at <laughs> Kennedy and Hannah. Wind up down a road that they can't turn around on, and <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point, and that that would be a, I would think that would be a really compelling argument to add to like ARC grant applications uh, because of the the effect that has on economic development. Yeah, that's a really good point. It can it can it can vary. Um, sometimes internet provider will just approach, like county commissioners, or they'll approach a municipality and say, "We want to serve your area. Can we get permission to ac uh, access any polls that you own?" Um, other times, it's the other way around. It's it's the government entity that reaches out to the internet providers, saying, "Hey, we have these areas. We'd like to see if we can get you to come uh, install here." That works better if you have something to bring to the table. Like I've, I've had some, sometimes folks will want to just like issue an RFP to get uh, internet providers to come serve a particular township or something. Uh, but it's essentially just a call for please come serve, come install infrastructure uh, versus like what Coshocton did where they had a couple of million dollars of ARPA money and they said, here's this offer. We will sub, you know, we will essentially provide you a grant to bring internet to here. Tell us what you'll offer. Um, that, that can work really well. Like, so both ways work, but I think it makes sense to be proactive and start it from the county or township level. Depending on the need and depending on the scope of it, like if it's a really big project, you might want a county commissioner to be making the, the championing that effect. If it's something in a town or village, it could be the mayor or it could be, in some cases, that you, you might be more appropriate if you've got like a county engineer or something that is aware of like the in physical infrastructure that's there. So you kind of have to look at the context of what you're trying to achieve there and, and what the space is and then sort of kind of the way we look for, well, where are the roads in this area? Well, who are the players in this area? Who are the ones with the, 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 like the strongest voice or willing to put in the time to actually advocate for this? Um, 
Mark and Melanie Swami are um, both the owner companies, and they live in West Bend. So just make sure you put your Mark and Melanie Swami to get that rolled out. So if you have some assistance, we'll let you know. Mm -hmm. a real necessary utility on us at this point, which I know you guys are all aware of. It's just as important as having water at your house in some cases, and it's as important as you know having heat, air conditioning, things of that nature, electricity. It's just, if we really want Appalachia and Ohio to grow and to remain relevant and competitive on a state or national stage, it's really one of these things that you know hopefully we can, first of all, encourage these healthcare companies to step up and put their money where their mouth is, and that's what Charter is doing, and you know, we know that we're going to have supportive local partners like you guys who are already doing a fantastic job, so we just need to rise to the stage. And I think even Charter, you know, I think of them as having been through the struggle with health care for many years, um, but just seeing so many times where they have not been able to make the kind of success that I think they've been able to, you know, and for your statement across the board, so I don't think there's any one single year when there's been any kind of thing that's not struggled with the lack of it. Right, we have been just trying to make the, not trying, I'm sorry, Sean probably may know the point, but even in farming, which is something that I'm a farm girl and I didn't even, you know, recognize that myself. The first company gave a presentation called Farming, and then when mm -hmm. he started to explain it, it made a lot more sense to me, so it's really seeping into those industries and those life that I personally wouldn't have considered or wouldn't have thought that broadband would play a role in, but it really does. Yeah, I, I would recommend if you have fine fil folks who've got the energy and the position to advocate and, and work with these, especially once we get you, uh, once Omega has this online version of the map so that you can interact with it and create because create specific areas that are zoomed in that you can you know, draw your lines around and thing. I've, I've found that kind of like that graphic I had with the, with the things rising over time, like if you can show somebody visually what you're talking about, sit down with them, and sometimes it's a matter of just printing, you know, make the image you want, zoom it into it, and then print it out, and then sit down with them and sit it next to like a regu regular county map or something and just say, Here's all the factors of why this is the place that needs funding right now. That that can go a long way. We have a, a new commissioner that's going to be coming online in about a week. That uh, you know, I think the previous group were all that interested in broadband, and uh, I think there's a chance in the interest we got out there have some input that maybe they'll be able to play a bit in getting things online. And I bet that's the. Um, is it from here? Do they have it? Yeah, it's from here. Okay. Um, but I know they mentioned that there was a. We did have a vehicle in the Orange Explorer. Yeah, I can see that. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I wonder if that's the the training because they're because Broadband Ohio is so working so to I get training programs up because yeah. Probably through Broadband Ohio, yeah. I'm going to cheat a little bit. And mm -hmm. if you um, can use this email address and things of that, you can hear from us and get that to you. Okay, great. Thank you. And they are really responsive. So definitely reach out to them, and you will get an answer. Any other questions? Anything online? or? Thank you, everyone. I'm 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 looking forward to